Good evening. Welcome to the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen. I'm Karen Taylor, the Program Director, and we're delighted that you could be here this evening. Uh, this, this lecture tonight is part of our Labour, Literature and Landmark Lecture Series. And the Labour, Literature and Landmark Lectures are supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. The landmark lectures are also supported by Bauer and Dean publishers. I also wanted to thank New York Landmarks Conservancy for their support in promoting tonight's event. I also want to remind you that at the end of the lecture, there's a short wine and cheese reception, which we'll be delighted if you could stay for. For those of you less familiar with the General Society, a brief introduction. The General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York is a non-profitable organization that was founded in 1785 by the skilled craftsmen of the city. Today, this 228-year-old organization continues to serve and improve the quality of life for the people of New York City uh, through its educational, philanthropic, and cultural programs. These include its tuition-free Mechanics Institute, uh, this wonderful library, which you are currently in, and a nearly 200-year-old lecture series of which tonight's lecture is part of. During the landmark lectures, four New York architects have chosen to highlight iconic buildings and landmarks of social, historical, and cultural significance with the series created by Lisa Easton, a partner at Easton Architects. Lisa is, also, is here this evening to introduce tonight's lecturer, Kate Lemus McHale. It is my great pleasure to introduce Lisa to you. Good evening. I want to thank you all for coming tonight, and I, it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce tonight's lecturer, Kate Lemus McHale, who's not only a fabulous architectural historian and architectural planner, but a dear friend of mine. Kate Lemus McHale is a senior associate at Bayer Blinder Bell. There, she does research and interprets historical and architectural and cultural context of buildings and districts to inform the design and preservation work for the firm. She has produced in-depth historical studies in many landmark buildings, including the U.S. Capitol, the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And she helps guide Bayer Blinder Bell's restoration, rehabilitation, and new construction projects through the public approvals process. Ms. Kate, Ms. Lemus McHale received her Master's of Science in Historic Preservation from Columbia University and her Bachelor's of Arts in Architectural Studies from Brown University. She is a co-author of the monograph Carrer and Hastings Architects, and she co-teaches a two-day course in historic preservation at the Pratt Institute for Center of Continuing Education. So it is my great pleasure to introduce to you, Kate, to give you a, a lecture tonight on uh, the 20th century, uh, I'm sorry, New York's finest Beaux-Arts masterpieces. So with that, I will turn it over to Kate. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, when Lisa asked me to participate in this lecture series, I was nervous um, because I was pregnant at the time and wasn't sure how I was going to put it all together, but here we are but also very excited. I've had the very good fortune to be able to work on and come to know very well some of my favorite buildings in New York. And so I just wanted to talk about them with you tonight and, and take you through their sort of original foundations, their design, challenges they've faced throughout the 20th century and what is happening with them today. And I should apologize um, for the content. There is quite a lot of information. Um, and it's not nearly enough, of course, to cover all of these buildings, but it is quite a lot to get through in one night. <laughs> uh, so we start with the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, it was constructed, its first wing constructed in Central Park in 1880, and its last additional wings constructed in the 1990s. The Met is actually a group of 22 individual buildings. A series of master plans were designed but never completely adhered to, resulting in a mostly piecemeal construction history and a heightened sense of exploration, 
and discovery as one navigates the building today. There were a few major multi-wing development periods, including McKim, Mead, and White's Fifth Avenue wings, which we'll look at today, um, and Roach, Dinkaloo's Central Park wings. A hundred years later, the museum is still adapting. It's, it's been evolving for its entire life, and it's a very exciting history. Um, looking at New York Public Library, it was designed in 1897 by Carrere and Hastings and opened in 1911. It was carefully designed with a rational plan aimed at a beautiful procession to a grand reading room located directly above the stacks facing Bryant Park for the highest efficiency of movement of books to scholars. It has been altered only minimally over the years with hidden additions beneath Bryant Park and within the South Courtyard. Today it faces a major challenge in terms of impact to its original design and identity with the proposed removal of book stacks um, and its collections from the building in order to fit in new reading rooms and circulating functions for other branch libraries. And Grand Central Terminal, designed by Warren and Wetmore and Reed and Stem in 1903 and opened in 1913. Key factors to its original success were its beautiful Beaux-Arts design, the smooth circulation of people and trains, and the idea of developable air rights by burying the tracks underground and developing the land above it for revenue. 100 years later, the idea of developable air rights almost meant the end of the building we know and love, and the city has significantly grown up around it. The circulation of people to and from trains still looks like an elegant ballet. Today, the terminal is a transportation center and a destination on its own. Um, this careful balance is precarious at times with popular um, retailers such as Apple and um, dining magnets such as the Shake Shack drawing large crowds. Wow, I still have <laughs> a little font issue earlier. <laughs> so we wanted to look through um, the first some historic context of, of all of these buildings and the history of New York. Um, starting in 1870 with the foundation of the Metropolitan Museum of Art and also the creation um, of the Grand Cent of sorry, the New York Central and Hudson River Railroad. Um, by Cornelius Vanderbilt. Um, Grand Central Terminal was actually the third of, th of um, three train stations constructed on the site. Um, and at the time, the site selected really drew a lot of ridicule. The city, um, at this point, hadn't grown much beyond 42nd Street. So the idea of putting a major train station at sort of the northern outreaches of the developed city seemed very strange. But Vanderbilt knew that this Manhattan was a narrow island and had only north to go. Um, and that one day his, his train station would be at the center of it all, of the greatest city in the world. Um, and he also technically wasn't able to build farther south because at that time most of the buildings were still wood frame construction and the train still operated on steam power and there was a great risk of fire. Um, so at that time, in 1875, train tracks were running along Park Avenue up the center. They were buried underground, but they were, I mean, it was still open. So this part of the city was really a, not a very pleasant area to live. It was full of um, sound and smoke. Um, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, founded in 1870 by a group of artists, intellectuals, businessmen who really wanted there to be a great art museum in America. Um, it had sort of humble beginnings in small buildings south of 14th Street. These are some examples of those before it finally um, made its site in Central Park. And, and the site was decided and worked out as part of, and sort of at the same time as Central Park was being designed by Calvert Vox and, um, and Olmsted, and the first wing of the, of, the of the library, I have to get my building straight, of the museum was designed by Calvert Vox himself. And in this context um, slide, just showing you the, the city at that time in 1891, still have a lot of you know, row house type and, and scale buildings in the Upper East Side. Um, and actually the development near the park really hadn't started yet. It still wasn't a, de a, a desirable place. The New York Public Library was founded in 1895 with the consolidation of the Astor Library and the Lennox Library and the Samuel Tilden Trust. Um, and these were two private libraries which had very limited opening hours and there was a lot of kind of derision in the press that they weren't functioning to help people actually study and better themselves. 
cities like Boston were getting grand public libraries and New York still didn't have one and so there was a push to create one. Um, and at that time, uh, the site that was located for the library was the existing Croton Reservoir site at the corner of 42nd Street and Fifth Avenue. And these are just some historical views looking at that very large structure uh, at this part of the city. And you can see the city's low scale at that point. Um, at this time, a lot of New York's architects were getting trained in the Beaux-Arts um, education in Paris. And the academic Beaux-Arts training emphasized rational interpretations of French and Italian Renaissance classicism, drawing from the structural rationalism of Greek temples and the Roman innovations of arches and domes. Students at the Ecole studied in ateliers with practicing architects. Primary to their training was careful study of the classical orders, including their scale and proportion, ornamental embellishments and symbolism, and plan compositions. Also of great importance was attention to program and function and the 19th century idea of an architecture parlant, that architectural design reflects a building's function and identity. Rational floor plans created symmetrical axial arrangements, a sense of sequence and circulation, and a hierarchy of spaces. In the facades, architectural elements were applied with the correct understanding of the orders, reflecting the function and hierarchy of the spaces within. In America, the style became particularly prominent after 1893 World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago, where Daniel Burnham's White City combined Beaux-Arts architecture with an idealized urban plan. Monumental Beaux-Arts architecture became linked with the City Beautiful movement in the United States, aimed at bringing monumental grandeur to cities, beautifying them while creating moral and civic virtue and increased quality of living among urban populations. Um, another aspect of the style is that it could be applied to a, no a number of different building types. So a lot of the architects practicing in it worked in New York and, and really around the country um, designing civic, cultural, um, private homes, clubs, um, you name it, in New York and places like Newport and Long Island and other cities in America. So in New York, we have a lot of architects that studied at the Ecole, and this is just a few. Um, of course, selected for the topic of this lecture. <laughs> but uh, Richard Morris Hunt, um, who designed the first Fifth Avenue wing of the Met, was the first American architect to study at the Ecole, and he entered in 1846. Charles Fallon McKim uh, went soon after in 1867. Thomas Hastings, Whitney Warren, um, and John Carrer also studied at the Ecole. And other architects, you know, practiced the style. It was very prevalent. And I was trying to get my head around sort of the begat and who begat and who begat of all of the relationships of New York architects. So I made this kind of silly diagram. Um, but here we can see we have our first architect to go, um, Richard Morris Hunt. Henry Hobson Richardson was also very influential, although he didn't practice in the Beaux-Arts style much. He really developed his own Richardsonian Romanesque. Um, but both Charles McKim and Stanford White worked in his office, and they formed their firm, uh, where Thomas Hastings and John Carrer both worked. Um, Whitney Warren was a good friend of Stanford White. The green lines indicate strong friendships. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, and he had a desk in the office, although it was never actually on the roster. Um, and from Carrer and Hastings' office, Williams, William Adams Delano and Chester Holmes Aldrich became an, a very important New York firm. And also Shreve Lyman Harmer, Harmon, who designed the Empire State Building, actually was the successor firm to Carrer and Hastings. All right, so now let's look at the buildings. We start with the non-Beaux-Arts history of the Met, um, with the first wing that was designed and constructed in Central Park. And here again is a uh, 1872 plan showing the site. Um, and this was designed by Calvert Vox and his partner Jacob Raymold in a, a Victorian style. This is in the sort of 1870s. Um, and what we see here is a very large building and the idea is an expanse of, um, of sort of intersecting long narrow galleries that receive natural light from outside you know, the streets and the park, but also very large um, courtyards in between. And they would connect at grander pavilions. Um, and so the, 
um, directors of the museum decided to start not with a Fifth Avenue grand building at this time, but to at least get their collections into a building. And so they asked the architects to develop first a sort of building that would be in the center of the museum, which it would then grow around. And so that building was constructed in 1880, called Wing A, not very creatively. Um, <laughs> and it was three stories of galleries. Um, and here is what that building looked like. It was a high Victorian Gothic, very kind of small, um, not grand, located sort of deep within Central Park, which not, wasn't yet a very desirable place to be. Um, and this is actually a view towards Fifth Avenue. So this is from the park looking towards Fifth Avenue. And this is a view from a view to the, from the northeast, I guess. So you can just barely see it here in the park and you can also see how kind of sparsely populated this area of New York still was. Um, the collections at the time were mostly painting, sculpture, and there was also always also a large collection of um, plaster models of architecture from around the world that was housed here. Um, the building did not get any praise in the press, it was not well loved, um, and when it came time to add to it, the trustees did not select Calvert Box to continue designing buildings, um, and selected instead another trustee, Theodore Weston, who was a civil engineer and he designed an addition here to the south. So this is a view from Fifth Avenue, um, and this becomes a new south-facing entrance to the museum. And he, of course, as you might notice, completely disregarded the master plan that um, Calvert Fox had created. In 1894, the museum expands again um, with um, Arthur Tuckerman's addition. He had worked with uh, Westman and really just mirrored the the wing B. So now we have a, a small, modest museum in the park with these three wings. Uh, and now we get to the first decades of the 20th century when the Beaux-Arts uh, aspect of the Met is built and also the two other buildings we'll look at tonight. Um, Richard Morris Hunt was asked by the trustees to develop a master plan for the museum, which he completed in 1895. And he had long been involved with the museum and a trustee and really was not happy with the architecture that it was producing. And he really wanted to do a Beaux-Arts Museum. Um, and so this is his plan, which really subsumes the existing museum uh, into a much larger plan. If, if built, this would have gone from 85th Street to 79th Street and would have required moving, you can kind of see the outlines here, the transverse roads to make room for it. Um, and so, he, his construction focused on first the entrance, the main entrance from Fifth Avenue, which was completed by his son. Um, Richard Morris Hunt passed away before this was completed, but his son, uh, Richard Howland Hunt, completed it. Um, and we see here a very kind of robust, classical uh, building, completely turning its back, literally and figuratively, on the previous Victorian architecture of the Met with a strong kind of triumphal arch motif. Um, and interestingly, you've probably wondered what these are. They were intended to be sculptural groups and for some reason were never carved at the time, probably money, and they just never were. And at a point, they took on a character of their own and so there they stay. So the main, uh, the main hall of this wing, called Wing D, they just kind of went up the alphabet, uh, originally housed collections. And so this is where the museum had its uh, sculpture. And an interesting part of this is how it connected to the original museum. And what um, he did was to create a grand stair on access with the entrance that would lead to the second floor painting galleries. So interestingly, instead of having a grand, clear axis of circulation on the first floor, it's sort of blocked by this grand stair. And there have been a lot of studies about maybe changing that um, since then because it proved to be kind of tricky for the museum. But it is part of the designated interior, which includes all of the, of the hunt entrance and that grand stair. Um, that's bright. In 1904, the museum um, had been going through a period of growth in terms of its collections, a change in leadership, um, 
At that point, J. Pierpont Morgan was involved as the museum's president. There was also a new director. The shift from kind of accepting gifts and, and bequests was made around this time to a more focused um, attempt to really go out there and find and collect and, and get the great masterpieces of the world. And so there needed to be a place for them. Um, so the museum asked the preeminent architectural firm of the time, McKim, Mead & White, to expand its Fifth Avenue frontage. And their um, first design for a master plan um, is a grand Beaux-Arts design, uh, which would have replaced the original wings of the museum with a grand dome at the center. And this, you know, is a very Beaux-Arts feature. It's um, centrally located. It's easy to find and plan. You can see it um, as it's expressed on the exterior. Um, and, but the museum director at the time said, he, I don't like domes. There's already enough of them in the museum. So it, was, it did not go forward. Uh, but interestingly, with the plan, we go to the next. Um, and now we're keeping the original buildings. Um, and this is now the idea of the facade and how it would stretch. And you may notice that it was originally designed to go farther than it actually does. It currently ends at these pavilions. Um, but we see a shift in how the galleries are treated. Instead of a single corridor lit on both sides, we now shift the galleries to the outside, and they are lit by interior courtyards along this kind of central area. But what that does is it cuts off an axis from the center entry point. So when you look this way, you just see a wall. Um, and so that was an interesting shift in the development of the design. The first thing that McKim, Mead, and White did, though, before building any wings was to do some work on the roofs of the, of the existing wings. And a lot of new skylights were created. And this is just an interesting view of what they did to change these kind of small um, oculi in the domes of Hunt's building and instead put a, a new roof instead of a series of cupolas and to bring in more light. The first wing, um, and I should say that uh, Charles McKim really was the designer behind, behind the master plan and the first wings. Um, and this is what we call wing E, which included um, an auditorium as well as gallery space. And you can see here, these would have been courtyards. So this is really how that new approach to laying out the galleries was carried out. And here it is being constructed. Um, at the end of this wing, we terminate in a two-story space, very grand. So this becomes a, a beautiful destination. And McKim had to fight for this. The director wanted not to lose the space that is being given up up here on the second floor. Um, but the idea of having this sort of well-lit, um, beautiful destination won the day. Um, the next wing to be constructed is called Wing F, which actually started to um, complete this kind of central axis, moving away from the Fifth Avenue wings. And this would house um, arms and armor in kind of the medieval collections. And it's beautifully lit from above clear story monitors. Um, the next wing was a library, a very small, beautiful little library, pure Charles McKim, um, that would have been off, that was off of the, the grand staircase that connected the Beaux-Arts wings with the Victorian wings above. And here, um, again, with the clear, sto the clear story lighting. The idea of bringing natural light in was very important. Um, and then finally, the southern Fifth Avenue wings, J and K. This is wing J, which has a two-story arched uh, barrel vaulted space. And it originally terminated in a one-story sort of Roman um, courtyard. Um, <laughs> which was another battle of the architects with the director. And in this case, the director won. Um, they, the architects really wanted another two-story space to be the destination for the two-story space that leads to it. But um, they did not get their way in this case. So here is the museum as it was finished with the kind of Beaux-Arts additions. And we have a very prominent Fifth Avenue, a complete Fifth Avenue wing. And that's really what reads still today and why we think of this building as a, as a Beaux-Arts building. Um, and it's interesting the way I think McKim, Mead, and White dealt with the existing building by Hunt 
they really were deferential in terms of creating these kind of smaller setback connecting wings and then um, some more prominent pavilions at the end. Um, they used arched windows really to kind of set a difference between his architecture and their own. Um, on the interior, however, they were not as deferential and they completely ignored the floor heights that he had established. And so there's actually, an, a, the second floor of the McKim, Mead, and White Wings is four and a half feet higher than the second floor of Hunt's Wing because they thought that he hadn't given it, you know, enough space um, to the galleries. And so there are stairs that one has to climb and ramps. And so this has had a major kind of impact as the museum grew throughout the century as well. Uh, and here's just an aerial view of the museum as completed in the 20s. And now we go to the New York Public Library. Uh, and this sketch is a very uh, simple sketch, but very important in the history of the library. And the trustees, um, once formed, uh, hired as the new director, John Shaw Billings, and he uh, had a lot of experience in library design and was very interested in how efficient they would work, efficiently bringing books to people and people to the reading room. And he studied a lot of existing libraries, and in the end, what he really wanted was a central entrance and to have a reading room that was um, closely associated with the stacks and that the reading room actually would be elevated above the stacks. And as the trustees and Billings uh, looked at other existing libraries, we look first at Boston, which had recently been constructed in 1895, a beautiful building designed by McKim, Mead, and White with a grand entry sequence to a beautiful reading room, but its stacks were not located directly near the reading room, and so there was a lack of efficiency there that Billings did not like. Um, the Library of Congress, had a more central rotunda reading room surrounded by stacks, so that was getting a little bit better. Uh, but the but the example that he liked, liked the best was, of course, the Bibliothèque Saint Genevieve in Paris, where we have a beautiful entrance hall and we go to a reading room that's directly above the book stacks. And this was a very important example. Um, so there is a. a a competition in 1897, and this was a huge um, commission, and so a lot of New York architects participated. Um, and it was actually done in two different competitions, an open competition from which the top six would go on to compete against six invited architects. And of those two competitions, then the final three were Carrere and Hastings, McKim, Mead and White, and Howard and Caldwell. They all had Beaux-Arts schemes. McKim, Mead, and White did not follow the billing sketch, which was included in the competition brief. Um, and while they said that wasn't the reason why they weren't selected ultimately, I think they really thought that what they decided how they wanted the library to work is what they wanted to see in their, in their winning design. Um, and Carrere and Hastings did that beautifully, and their design was unanimously selected. So what we have is then a main entrance from Fifth Avenue into a grand entry hall, um, an axial connection here, which leads you to specialized reading rooms. And then up the stairs we go to um, the main catalog room and then the main reading room. And here it is in section, and this is really the important aspect of that design is the location of the room reading room directly above the stacks. And it was somewhat controversial. A lot of people thought that um, the reading room should be on the first floor. It should be one of the first spaces you enter. Um, and that putting it all the way on the third floor was really kind of a pain. Um, but the architects um, and the director really felt that it elevated the study and the scholarly pursuits kind of figuratively and literally. Um, and it allowed for this direct connection, which was very important with the books. Uh, so here's the building once completed, and it's a beautiful design. We have, again, the sort of triumphal arch motif at the grand entry. We have some connecting wings, two pavilions. The side elevations are slightly less ornamental. We see the roof line of the reading room and of the grand catalog room rising above. So we are having this expression of the interior functions. Um, 
And then on the Bryant Park facade, it's beautifully integrated into its setting, which was another important aspect for their design. Um, and we also have an expression of the functions within with the reading room above the book stacks. Um, the building opened in May 1911, and very sadly, only a couple of months after the death um, of John Carrere, he was killed in a car accident. Um, and his body was actually laid in state within the library before it was officially opened, and he was given a really beautiful tribute for his contributions to architecture. Um, the, the construction of the building did take a very long time. It was very um, a, a technical building to produce, but also a very beautiful one, and there were um, a, many uh, artists and craftsmen involved in the design and the construction of the building. All of the carved ornament was done by hand, and most of it was done first in a series of plaster casts to really get it right. Um, and here is an image of some very brave men assembling the cornice over Fifth Avenue. Um, a lot of decorative features on the site, some designed by the architects themselves, all carried out by the leading uh, artists and sculptors of the, of the day. Um, the New York Public Library Lions, of course, Patience and Fortitude, named by Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia, um, have become sort of the heart of the library and their and you know how the library is identified. These are just a series of New Yorker cartoons and covers. Um, and they put up with a lot, including pigeons and amorous architectural historians. <laughs> uh, so looking closer at the, at the entryway, it's, it's a, as we, we see this beautiful um, triumphal arch design, which has the arches framed by columns and then set within a more solid framing element. Thomas Hastings really didn't like this in the end and it bothered him. And so before he died, he redesigned it and he left money for his wife. So when she died, she would leave in her will to the library funds to carry out his design. And in fact, um, the architects in his firm uh, did draw up plans for it, but for one reason or another, it never happened. But it's just interesting to me that he would just care so much after the building was built that he wanted this to happen. And looking in comparison to the other buildings, we do have a sort of similar treatment with the paired columns, and he just felt that that was more correct in working with the orders. We enter the building in the grand um, entry space with the grand stair leading up to another hallway where you can see kind of the spaces above and very clearly understand your procession and where you're going. Um, and this is takes after many um, other Beaux-Arts building. We see here the grand staircase at the Paris Opera, and this is the grand entry in the Library of Congress. Uh, we reach the top of the stairs and go through um, the main catalog room into the main event, the reading room. A beautiful, grand, long space, um, naturally lit from both sides. The, um, the furniture and the lighting fixtures, everything in the space is designed by Carrere and Hastings. Um, and central to it all is the, the catalog book um, collection area. And some people thought that this really was a problem in the space because it interrupted the clear view. But to the architects, it was the why the space existed and how it connected to the book stacks and very important. And then this is, I love this section drawing showing the stacks below and their direct connection up into the reading room. And these are seven stories of self-supporting uh, book stacks in that space. And they are expressed clearly on the, ex on the rear facade, which is actually, I think, my favorite facade of the building. Um, and I think I may be the only one who thinks this, but to me it reads like the books are the columns. If you sort of imagine that these Windows are, are a colonnade, and it kind of elevates the, the function of the library to that level. Um, and then, just to finish, there is also originally in the function of the library, it was a circulating library. It was the main branch of the New York Public Library circulating system. And this was housed in this beautiful space that's in the north courtyard. Um, so here is the library as completed. Um, 
and it's very similar, of course, to what it looks like today. Just a beautiful uh, building, well sited. It has a lot of decorative elements, and it has a clear expression of, of functions within. Um, and now we go to Grand Central, which, as we said, was the third train station or terminal, I should say, built on the site. We saw the first one in the 1900, it was transformed and enlarged, but it still was not big enough for the functions that it needed. Um, and this is a view of the train shed, which at the time was one of the largest interior spaces in the country. Um, and at this, this was a real turning point for the railroad um, with the, um, the dawn of electricity. And the, the railroad's um, engineer, William Wilgus, really was pushing to electrify the tracks, which would allow them to go underground, but that would really change everything. They would need kind of a new building, a new way of trains to get in and out. It was a huge undertaking, and, and the Vanderbilts were a little bit slow to pick up on it. In 1902, there was a terrible um, fatal crash in one of the tunnels because a conductor couldn't see signals because of the steam, and that really, even though plans were kind of already going, that was really the catalyst. In 1903, there was a design competition um, that was invitational. Only four architecture firms were invited. Uh, and they developed grand schemes. These are, these are both looking from the north over the tracks that would be buried, um, similar to that kind of uh, Colombian exposition, Court of Honor, we really have this sort of white city. Um, Reed and Stem, a firm from St. Paul, Minnesota, were selected. They had a lot of experience with design of railroad stations, so they really understood how to get people to trains, trains in and out. They were really kind of circulation specialists. Um, one of them was also married to Wilgus's sister, but that's a small detail. <laughs> um, Warren and Wetmore were assigned to the project as associate architects. Whitney Warren had family connections to the Vanderbilts, um, and he was able to talk them into having a more local and prominent Beaux-Arts trained firm um, do the architectural design. So it was not always a very happy relationship, um, but the end result was much better than either could have done by themselves. And so what we have is a beautiful uh, Beaux-Arts structure with a very intricate plan of train circulation and people circulation. Um, and I should point out that there were original plans to develop um, an office tower above the station. There was structure built into the original building um, in anticipation of that. And also, this is an early plan of the concourse. There was an original idea to have a second stair. So the stair we see there today, which you'll see, is not original. But it was intended. So here's another one of these amazing sections, and it just really shows how this building could function like a living organism almost. The, um, the first, the sort of main concourse level was just for your grand sort of intercity cross-country trains. Um, and the lower concourse was just for the suburban sort of commuters. And there really weren't connections between the two. You either came from your train to the subway or you got dropped off from your car and you got on your train. So it was a really kind of interesting differentiation there. Uh, and here's an image, of course, of the beautiful main concourse as it originally was opened. Um, and then this is the ramp that led down from the main concourse down to the suburban. And you can see here, this is the top of the back of the ticket booths. And this continues at that level across this ramp, which leads from the main waiting room to the main concourse. And so people who were walking here to their trains were not, couldn't be seen by the people going to their, um, to their suburban commuter trains. And here we have that lower concourse, which had its own ticket windows. Um, again, like the other buildings, a lot of beautiful attention to ornament and detail. A lot of artisans were included. Um, this is a French artist, Sylvain Salieres, who uh, was responsible for the sculptural decoration. And again, a lot of plaster models were created first before the hand carving. And here, I love this photo, taking a little snooze maybe. Um, but key to the development and success of the train state of the of Grand Central was this idea of develop of developable air rights by lowering the tracks underground 
it would allow the train company to develop these sites and to get revenue from them. Um, and so these are just some um, images of the construction north of the train, of the terminal, and the eventual transformation of Park Avenue from a, a place that was not desirable at all to a very beautiful avenue that we know today. Um, and this is a great aerial photo with the buildings constructed over the tracks um, highlighted. And then of course the New York Central Building that was constructed north of the terminal, which is now the Helmsley Building, is prominent in that skyline. And at that time, there weren't tall enough buildings to block the sunlight coming in. <laughs> uh, so we go through the, the middle portion of the century, a lot of change for these buildings. Um, and we look ahead to the city of tomorrow, where I guess everyone needs Le Corbusier glasses. <laughs> Um, so we're going to start with the Met, and the Met at this time, um, this is the existing arrangement of spaces. Because it had been developed kind of piecemeal over time, the collection arrangement was a bit of a mess. Um, and this was a time in sort of uh, in the 1940s um, that they really felt their responsibility and their place in the world. As World War II was waging and in the aftermath, and a lot of the world's great museums in Europe um, were dealing with the reconstruction of their cities and didn't have time or maybe were closed while their cities were being reconstructed. So the Met really felt its sort of role not only in peacekeeping to educate Americans about the arts around the world but also to have a place where great art could be seen in the world at that time. And so the director really had some really wanted to expand and reorganize the museum and the, and the idea that, that came out of this um, was to create a series of museums within the museum. So you don't come and expect to do the Met in one day. You come and you have a destination and you go um, and you know where it is and you go to it. And, <laughs> um, and so there was a museum of ancient art, Greece and Rome, and a museum of ancient art of Egypt and the Near East. This would be the first floor. And this was the idea that this is sort of the foundations of the art that would be on the second floor. So the kind of Western, more modern painting and sculpture would be above um, on the south side and the Eastern, more contemporary art would be on the north side. And behind it in the older wing would be a museum of decorative art. So that's where you get more of the sort of medieval and Renaissance art and, and um, so it's an interesting kind of shift in their curatorial program at that time. And they were also looking at creating a new museum of American art. Um, there were talks with the Whitney Museum of, li of linking with the Met at that time. So um, that never actually happened, but this was a, a grand scheme. And here it is um, drawn by Hugh Ferris um, in the sort of typical uh, mid-century stripped down classical design approach. Um, and this was done by Robert O'Connor and Amar Embury in 1944. They also looked at um, replacing the grand staircase with a vehicular entry for the a drop off for the building. Um, other schemes at this time looked at, again, dealing with the, st the grand staircase getting into the museum. This would have had a very, you know, kind of modern democratic entrance there at the ground level and bringing people up via escalators halfway into the Great Hall. So that would have been an interesting change. Um, small things were done during this time. We have the redesign of Wing A into what we see today. So this creates, um, this is now the, the sorry, the medieval collections that, that stayed in the museum were housed here. The rest went to the cloisters when that opened. Um, and also in our, um, our court at the south wing, we have this beautiful fountain and that was turned into um, a restaurant. The original auditorium by McKim, Mead and White was replaced by the Grace Rainey Rogers Auditorium in the 50s, designed by Voorhees, Walker, Foley and Smith. Uh, and the original McKim, Mead and White Library was replaced by the new Thomas J. Watson Library. So there's actually a fine example of the international style now added to the library. Um, at this time, New York Public Library was looking to expand, and it was also working with Amar Embury, and they had designed um, an exp expansion of their stacks, 12 stories of stacks that would have gone um, 
in the courtyards in front of the reading room. Um, and at that time, the circulating function left the library and they constructed the Donnell Library, also designed by um, Embury. And that closed recently, but it was the location of the Winnie the Pooh original dolls, very important. Um, at this time in the 50s, we have a lot of changes in the country, obviously, with travel and technology that impacted Grand Central. Um, we have the development of a national highway system. Um, we have the beginning of suburban development. This is Levittown in Long Island. Um, and so the kind of, the era of the car has, has, is upon us. And this is a f begins to affect train travel. And then, of course, we have the era of the air travel. Um, which further affects the train travel. So we start to see a lot of decline for Grand Central in terms of its ridership and its revenue. And then we have the air travel coming very close to home with the construction of the Pan Am building right behind it um, in 1958. And this is an interesting design to replace the building altogether by IMP. And of course, the demolition of Penn Station, another very important Beaux-Arts landmark, was an important turning point in the city. Um, while there was already a landmarks law being developed, it wasn't yet in place, and so there were no legal teeth to stop the demolition. Um, it brought preservationists and modern architects, this is Philip Johnson, out to really fight to save this building. Um, and it did finally um, give the kick the city needed to develop the Landmarks Law and the Landmarks Preservation Commission. So when after Penn Station um, was torn down, the Landmarks Commission is established and one of its first tests, big tests, was this puppy. <laughs> so <laughs> the, um, the terminal, the Grand Central was designated as one of the first landmarks, not surprisingly. Um, and in 1968, after the um, New York Central Railroad had merged with the Pennsylvania Railroad to create Penn Central, and they were working with a developer who leased the air rights above the terminal and wanted to um, put up a 55-story building right on top of it. And at that point, the, uh, the concourse was not yet an interior landmark, but there was obviously a sense of its importance. The first proposal would have obliterated the concourse, the Landmarks Commission said that this was not an appropriate addition to the building um, and turned it down. The developers came back with a second, which instead of obliterating the main concourse, obliterated the whole front facade. <laughs> so that was also turned down. <laughs> um, and then Penn Central um, fought this tooth and nail as, as a takings case. Um, and, and took the city to court, and it was tried first at the um, New York State Supreme Court. Um, and there were a couple things that happened that really helped save the day. The, so the state court um, sided with Penn Central and delegitimized the landmarks designation and said that it constituted a takings of the highest and best use of the, of the landmark building. Um, Going forward, it was appealed to the Supreme Court. Um, Jackie Kennedy got involved. There's a wonderful story of her calling up MAS and asking to speak to Kent Barwick. Sure, may I tell him who's calling? Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. And they thought it was a joke, but thankfully it was not a joke. And she was very important in really galvanizing public support and fighting, And even though things were looking very dire. And at the, at the side of the Landmarks Commission, Dorothy Minor, who some of us had the pleasure of studying with, um, was very influential as well as the counsel for the Landmarks Commission. And she was working with the city law department to fight this every step of the way. And they argued the case to the Supreme Court. Um, and basically it was an issue of weighing the benefits of landmark designation as a tool of, of um, land use regulating. Um, and of bettering the city and protecting our heritage against what um, was being argued as a takings of the highest and best use. But what it was determined was that it, you don't need to get your highest and best use. You can still have a reasonable return and the building can still function and it's better that it is preserved. And so they upheld the Landmarks Commission and the Landmarks Law and that was very important in the, in the history of our whole city, I think. Um, 
But after that, the, the, state, the Grand Central really had a lot of problems. Um, it didn't have any, a lot of money to deal with them, so it really was going into decline. The ticket booths, most of them were turned into off-track betting booths. Um, and so these are some New Yorker cartoons poking fun at that. Um, this lady is saying, what the hell do you mean you don't sell tickets to Larchmont? Um, the waiting room was, a lot of homeless people were staying in the waiting room. Um, the condition of just the interior finishes was terrible after all this time with smoke and dirt. Um, th there were a lot of accretions over time, revenue making, um, advertising, etc. cetera. Um, Bayer Blinder Bell was hired to do a master plan and to study the restoration and did a very full on restoration. Of, of Grand Central. The first thing was to remove the Kodak sign and to let the light shine in again. Um, we saw that original plan that, anti that had looked at an eastern stair. One had not been built, but a way to bring kind of more activity to this space would be to introduce a new stair. So BBB designed a new stair that was similar to uh, but not identical to the original stair. So it's differentiated from the original, but it's still the same kind of material quality. Um, and it's just a little sim more simplified um, and, and more sleek. The ceiling was cleaned. This is not a heavenly beam of light, but is this, the cleaning sample that was first done. And it was done very carefully by hand on scaffolding that ran on train tracks to keep the uh, station below functioning. Um, the waiting room was transferred into um, a multi-purpose space, and you've all probably gone through there to the Christmas market. They have um, sporting events in there, all number of things. There's currently an RFP out for um, a high-end restaurant use, so it'll be interesting to see how that gets incorporated. Um, they would have to take down everything to three times a year, I think, for the Christmas market and other events. Um, the MTA had built offices above um, this area here behind the ticket booths, and so another important part of this renovation was to remove those and to recreate this beautiful volume of space. And other aspects included circulation, new circulation that really opens up kind of lines of visibility, new retail that's in keeping with the style of the original building and really gives the place, let us, it be a destination on its own. Of course, now we have the Apple Store also in the concourse itself, so the retail presence is definitely there. Um, dining has always been a part of the experience of Grand Central. This is a 1941 New Yorker cover, and that has really been increased and enhanced too with the with the um, these new changes. Today, uh, the station. This is the footprint of Grand Central Terminal. It's being connected to the Long Island Railroad um, as part of the East Side Access pro Project, which is well underway. And this is just an enormous underground terminal that is being constructed that will connect people down to a number of different train tracks buried under Park Ave. And these are some of the designs for the, those new kind of um, circulation spaces in the new scheme. Of course, another challenge is the rezoning proposed of, of um, Midtown East. And this would raise the allowable FAR for, raise what is as of right for buildings in exchange for such things as um, public space improvements. Um, but this really does, um, the highest FAR is of course right <laughs> around the station. So there really is quite a, this will be a change for this part of the city. Um, and other, other studies have been done recently in light of this, just to kind of see what some possible ideas would be of developing that. This is kind of a crazy one by SOM. This was part of an MAS study. Um, so now we go to the Met. Uh, a lot of things changed when the river started to rise on this, the Temple of Dendur in Egypt. New York was uh, selected, the Met was selected to receive and to house it. Um, and this was done in sort of the late 1960s. The Met at that time had hired um, Roach Dinkaloo to develop a master plan to expand the building and, and to reach actually more of the full footprint that had been originally envisioned. 
in blue are parts of the Met that were existing at the time. And the plan developed a lot of um, beautiful kind of glassy, transparent um, garden pavilion type structures to house art. Um, but the first thing that happened was to deal with the front entry, um, which was always very overcrowded. It was kind of a small, um, a small stair relative to the vast size of the Fifth Avenue. So here we have the, the um, Roach Dinkaloo plan that created a much grander stair and fountains um, in the 1970s. Then of course we have all of the new wings designed, you know, to have a similar rhythm um, and composite an organization as the Fifth Avenue Wing, but of course in a much more contemporary architecture. And we do have these garden pavilions and turning what maybe original um, master plans had looked at as being open courtyards into now very open and daylit galleries for art. Um, the building at this point was a New York City landmark and it's in Central Park, which is in a landmark. Um, landmark, because it was city owned, Landmarks actually wasn't the primary reviewer of this, but they did weigh in. Um, and they found that these more glassy additions were appropriate. They understood the idea and kind of references back to 19th century um, garden pavilion. And here we see the Charles Engelhard Court, which is the, um, the American wing. This is a, a 1924 addition to the museum actually that incorporated an 1820s facade and now that is an interior courtyard. Um, we have of course the Temple of Dendur in its beautiful glassy expanse. Um, and one of the aspects of this was that in order to achieve sort of a unified facade, um, the architects didn't want to see the kind of red brick um, facades of the original buildings of the Met. So those were covered and the new um, wing was created here, but you still do see the, the back facade of wing A. This is one space in the museum, you can see that. The Rockefeller wing and the Lila Atchison uh, wing for modern art. Interestingly, the original um, painting, uh, modern painting galleries that were um, built in the 80s uh, were redesigned completely 10 years later um, in a style that much more resembled the McKim Mead and White wings of the building. Uh, and this is the Petrie Court of European sculpture, which again really allows you to read that original um, facade of the building. Uh, and a couple, this is the Greek and new Greek and Roman galleries. Um, so Roach Dinkaloo also did have some projects within the McKim buildings. Here they finally achieved what McKim, Mead, and White had wanted with a two-story. Um, and here it was lost with the creation of the Astor Court on the second floor. So a little bit of historical reversal there. Um, and then of course new galleries for the American Wing and for Arab um, art and soon to open new Costume Institute renamed um, the Anna Wintour Costume Center. Uh, and finally, we have the new plaza design, which is under construction. This is designed by Olin Studio. Um, it maintains the grand stair entrance. Um, it reopens up kind of axial connections to these connector wings um, and continues to have plantings and fountains. Um, so the museum today, here we have it in an aerial view. It's been totally built out into its footprint and above its footprint. This is another wing that was constructed above those grand stairs. Um, Bayer Blinder Bell has been working with the Met uh, to produce a long-term feasibility study, just planning, looking at their existing facilities and looking at planning with them for their future. Um, and that's been quite an interesting exercise. Um, the New York Public Library, now the Stephen A. Schwartzman Building, of course, uh, in the 1990s extended its stacks under Bryant Park. Um, and here you can see some construction photos of that. Uh, the first and only above ground addition to the New York Public Library was in 2002 with the South Court edition, um, which was a very delicately inserted, keeping the visibility of the original uh, facades of the uh, South Court and putting in space for scholars and staff. 
Uh, the museum created a new library for science, industry, and business designed by Glockley Siegel. And also there's the Mid-Manhattan Library across Fifth Avenue. And it is now the desire to merge these um, branches back into the New York Public Library and house them um, in the library itself uh, that is sort of what the library faces today. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a really big challenge to the library. Um, and so the idea is to take out the stacks, to move some of the books, what they can fit into the, um, the space under Bryant Park. A lot of it will have to go to storage in New Jersey. Um, and to move the collections from these two buildings in here and to create reading rooms and circulating functions. Um, and the design by Norman Foster, the impact that it would have on the exterior has been approved by the Landmarks Commission, but the stacks themselves are not a, a landmark. They're not designated. So this is approved to go ahead, um, and it would be a major change, of course, to the meaning of sort of the library without its books, but it is an interesting um, reuse of the space. It does incorporate some book stacks and out of the Landmarks um, process, they were asked to include more of the book stack. So there is some redesign going on. Um, we hope that it could be saved by the Ghostbusters. <laughs> but without them, we'll have to rely on the mayor. Um, this was him uh, as public advocate. He came out um, and, and asked the library not uh, to really to restudy this. And there is quite a lot of city funding that, is in, that would be involved that he sort of put a hold on while there is a study, an ongoing study. Uh, so we shall see. And then to conclude, my funny diagrams. <laughs> um, it's been really interesting to look at these buildings all together and to really see kind of how their plans have fared over, over this past hundred years. Um, and there have been various degrees of success to which they've been able to adapt to change. Um, if we look at the Met, I think we can see that it's benefited from continuously evolving, uh, yet its Fifth Avenue facades are still very primary to our understanding of it, and it still reads to us as a Beaux-Arts landmark building. Um, Grand Central Terminal reached a point of crisis, um, and thankfully, the sort of do or die that the company thought it needed didn't happen, and the restoration was able to happen. Um, it does still exist as its original building. Its functions have somewhat changed, but I think one of the most successful um, aspects of the Bayer Blinder Bell rehabilitation was to reinterpret that beautiful circulation in a new way that works for how the building needs to work today. Um, and then New York Public Library is really the least changed of the three. It's really the purest Beaux-Arts design. It's a very rational plan. It's aimed at getting people to a special place. Um, and that really is being challenged. The idea of this special place and its connection to the books and the whole meaning of the library is what's being challenged today. Um, so with that, I would welcome any questions. Thank <laughs> you.